Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here once again. You've actually caught me in the middle of uh, performing some late night electronic surgery here, exploratory surgery. I have the Keykeepers DCR TRV280 Handycam in partially in a partially disassembled state here. And the reason why I'm doing this has to do with something that took place a couple of months ago. In recent times, I have been shooting all of my videos with this HDR PJ200 High Definition Handycam. And while I certainly think it's a decent camera for the price, and I really like the fact that it's got a built-in video projector, I have to admit that I miss the uh, DCR TRV280 Handycam that I used to use on a regular basis after I upgraded from the old Panasonic Lumix Point and Shoot. This DCR TRV280 is actually a Handycam that I bought secondhand from fellow YouTube user VWestLife. I used it for a couple of years and then it encountered an unfortunate incident. Now it still works just fine for the most part. The tape mechanism is completely functional. In fact you can see I've got the tape sitting over there because of what I'm doing here. But I went to use this camera as yet another video source during one of my live streams. I had it up on a tripod and rather than going to get an extension cord like I should have done, I strung the cables across the walkway thinking, oh, you know, I'll just remember to step above them, no problem. And then something came up that demanded my attention rather suddenly, and you guessed it, I tripped over the power cable. Fortunately, the Handycam did not quite go crashing to the floor but it did hit a few things on its way down from the tripod and the the most immediate form of damage was actually to the power supply that I was using at the time this is a Sony, what model is this? This is an ACL10B. Apparently they produced a lot of different variations on this supply. There's an L15 and an L15B that are electrically compatible with this and um, what happened to the power supply is that the connector on the end, you can see it suffered a bit of an indignity here. It was actually ripped free and ripped apart when the Handycam went south. Instead of breaking the connector off the board of the Handycam, it broke the connector off of the power supply's business end instead, which, while certainly the preferable outcome, has left me in a bit of a pickle because here we have this perfectly working power supply that's got a broken connector and thus it's unreliable. I did push it back together, as you see, but it's really not right, and so it's power output is highly intermittent. Not to mention the fact that it could probably short out given the AirSat's nature of uh, having simply pushed the connectors back together without a whole lot of regard for how they were originally routed or anything like that. What I would like to do, since this is otherwise a perfectly good power supply, I'd love to find out what these connectors are called. They don't have any maker name on them, they don't have any code numbers printed on them, and I really have a hard time imagining that Sony Corporation designed a proprietary connector and then got a company to produce it for their exclusive use. I would like to think that they simply found a connector that was significantly off the beaten path, but is actually some manufacturer's standard part. What I may do to solve this problem, if I can't figure out, or, any, or anyone who happens to watch this video can't tell me what kind of connector this might be. I might just buy one of those cheap uh, counterfeit or compatible Sony power supplies from China and simply chop the end off of it and chop the end off of this one and graft the two back together. That would give me the advantage of having a lot longer of a total power cord length for this power supply and it would certainly restore it to operation. Unfortunately that was not the extent of the indignities. The most obvious thing that was damaged in this Handycam's fall was the built-in video light. There's ordinarily a lens on this light. It looks just like this. You can see it's got a frosted surface over it to help diffuse the uh, extremely bright and focused beams from those three LEDs inside the lamp base here. And unfortunately that broke off. And then one day I was shooting a video with this camcorder and something else happened, and I can't help but think that it's probably related to its unfortunate fall from the tripod. Something went twang one day when I went to swing out the little video display here on the side, the built-in monitor, because that's usually how I shoot video with my camcorders that have such a display, as opposed to using the viewfinder. And now you can see this thing is all wiggly and loose. And that in and of itself, I could probably ignore that as being a problem. 
but it has the nasty side effect of making the switch between the internal viewfinder and the external display very erratic, and thus it's almost impossible to use this camcorder and monitor the results of your recording as you happen to be going along, because this can switch on and off at any time. But right now, it happens to be working just fine. You know, if I take the lens cap off here, you can see that it's uh, presently looking at the edge of the Model M keyboard and also the stereo receiver that's sitting right in front of it. I don't know if I can make it fail or not, but I would be willing to bet that if I closed it, the, say, the video probably should have turned off and so should the backlighting and should have gone to the viewfinder. But as you can see, the switching mechanism is definitely not working appropriately. So that's why I went ahead and decided to pull apart the KeyKeepers DCR-TRV280 Handycam because it still has a good display assembly. Unfortunately, when V-Westlife sold this Handycam to us, he said, you know, this has got a little bit of a problem, but there's this fix, and I say fix with scare quotes around it, the Paddle a Handycam, or Whack a Sony fix. There's a back tension and possibly an alignment issue in the tape mechanism on these, and it doesn't happen to all of them. Some of them never do it. This one has never had any problem with it, and I haven't had any problems with any of my other Video 8 Handycams of a similar vintage. But this one was always a little fidgety, and every time it acted up, we were simply able to get it going again by giving it a good sound spanking right on the bottom paddle here, right on the bottom of the unit there. Unfortunately, that seems to have finally stopped working, and this unit is now mangling tapes when it's loaded, and the basket will not snap shut when there is a tape in place. Now, maybe it could be fixed. After all, I do have the service manual up here, but I just don't know that it's worth the bother. The keykeeper has already expressed interest in maybe getting a new camcorder, although with his job being the way it is, for those of you who have been wondering where he's been, and why he hasn't shown his face on YouTube. He's just been very, very busy with his work. So what I'm doing here is I actually downloaded the Sony service manual for this camcorder model. You can find it online through a well-placed web search using your favorite search engine. And I went ahead and followed the instructions just to see how difficult this might be because at first, it looks kind of daunting, really. <laughs> I'll go over here and scroll to the beginning of the procedure you actually have to start on the tape loading side of the camcorder and remove almost all of the exterior fascia. You have to remove the top piece, the uh, side cover for the tape loading basket along with the hand strap and the lens cap, and then you seemingly also have to remove the front portion of the camcorder as well, the lens and the illumination and the microphone assembly. And I definitely did have to do all of those things, and only when I had done those things was I able to go over here and disassemble the other side of the camcorder. Despite this thing's relatively disassembled state, it would still operate. Basic controls would be uh, essentially functional. You could start and stop a recording and turn the power on and off to this thing, although it wouldn't be able to record sound and you wouldn't be able to do any kind of playback oriented operations or anything like that, but basically, despite this thing's somewhat dismantled appearance, <laughs> it would still work largely as normal. You can see that Sony really has focused on a very compact assembly here. They built this thing in just about as little space as they possibly could. I thought it was interesting that the video head drum was not shielded on the other side of this tape basket assembly. But that has the advantage of making it very easy to do a manual head cleaning if you ever need to, and a cleaning tape doesn't happen to be enough. I also noticed with great interest that there's a little foam pad that sits alongside the spinning video head. That is, in case you're wondering, actually used to perform a self-cleaning cycle whenever the tape transport is in the process of loading, unloading, or shutting down. I don't know exactly under what circumstances that cleaning pad is called into service, but as you can see, it's not actually very dirty, and usually my opinion of those self-cleaning pads is pretty low. The ones in uh, later VHS VCRs have a bad habit of getting dirty over the years with oxide and magnetic and other magnetic materials and components that have been shed off of the tape and then they end up making the video head dirtier rather than cleaner whenever they're called into service. So in that case I usually just go ahead and remove them because they cause more trouble than they solve after they've had time to get dirty. But as you can see that one doesn't actually look to be dirty at all. Anyway, getting back to what I was actually doing here, I've taken all of these pieces off of the handycam, 
There's the uh, tape basket cover and the hand strap. There's the top portion of the uh, camcorder's trim. That is all that sits between that head drum and the outside world, so it's not even very well protected. And then here's the front piece of the camcorder. You can see that I removed the light lens, which I showed you just a moment ago. And you can also see that there is a printed circuit board up here that provides multiple functions. This thing provides for the night shot infrared illuminator LEDs that are behind that smoked plastic cover. That's actually completely transparent to infrared light wavelengths. And if this, uh, if this HDR PG, PJ200 camcorder had a night shot mode, I would demonstrate that for you, but unfortunately it does not. You also have the little, uh, this kind of an interesting assembly. Rather than run wires or use a connector, they simply extended the uh, foil traces off the end of the printed circuit board for the uh, LED illuminator light. And then, of course, down here we have the stereo microphone. Now, one thing that some of you have probably noticed about my previous videos is that you can very plainly hear the noise of the spinning head drum motor whenever the camera is recording. Now, I suspect that when these camcorders were brand new, that head drum motor was almost silent and then it's simply gotten louder over time as the bearings have aged and perhaps the lubrication has migrated off of them. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be possible to apply some sort of isolating material. I found a little foam pad in my junk pile here. I don't imagine this is probably very good for sound deadening purposes, but when I go to, when I go and swap the uh, good pieces off of the Keykeeper's Handycam onto this other unit that belongs to me, I'm probably going to go ahead and try that and just see if it actually does result in any improvement. I'm not too optimistic that it will because there's this metal band that runs along the backside of the microphone and this actually looks like it might serve as a grounding point because as you can see it runs down to the bottom of this plastic assembly and then has a screw run through it that connects it to the main body of the Handycam and that may be how a lot of the noise is getting into the microphone to start with. I'm a little surprised that Sony didn't think of that when they manufactured this thing, when they designed it, but maybe they never considered that the head drum would ever get to be as noisy as it has become in these units or that people would be using them for so long. But there are certainly still some people out there, myself included, who are definitely interested in using these camcorders, not least of which because they have a lot of features that the newer camcorders, the consumer level camcorders anyway, simply do not have. One of the most prominent features that I really like on this old DCR TRV 280 is the ability to turn on the night shot feature and shoot in complete darkness and also to use that feature in situations that are not uh, night shooting or in complete darkness such as the time I made the video about shooting with the IR pass filter on the lens of this thing. Special infrared photography. This thing also has the capability of superimposing time, date, and titles and on your video. It also has the built-in video light and a fader. Now while I expect that the uh, HDR PJ200 can probably at least impose the time and date on the videos that it can take. I don't think it has any of the fader functions. It certainly doesn't have night shot and it definitely does not have a video titler. So that's an overview of what I've been doing here as well as a look at some of the things that go into making this work. This, these handy cams actually seem pretty well designed. I'm pretty impressed with the quality of the design here. You know, undoubtedly there were things that Sony could have done better, but for the most part I think they did a very, very good job. I think this was before Sony had truly kind of, shall we say, lost the plot with regard to the quality of their products. You can see there is an awful lot of integration here, a very interesting comparison and contrasting to an old camcorder if you've ever happened to take one apart. You can see that the lens assembly is very highly integrated. This is probably the zooming or the autofocus motor one right there on the lens assembly. You can also see that the night shot switch is part of that assembly as well because that would actually move an infrared blocking filter out of the way. And when Sony first debuted Night Shot on their camcorders, it was a much more powerful feature than it is on any of these particular later models, mainly because Sony got in trouble because there were perverts out there in the world who discovered 
that it was possible, or at least theorized to be possible, to use night shot to see through certain types of clothing made of certain types of material. And so Sony drastically reduced the effectiveness of night shot, which was unfortunate for those of us who like to use it for legitimate purposes or interesting explorations of how objects behave when they're illuminated by infrared light in conditions that are not complete darkness. There's also a micro switch here on the night shot switch that serves to tell the camera that night shot has been engaged, which disables several of the uh, exposure controls, the backlight compensation, various things like that, and it reduces the camera's functionality when it's in night shot mode, thus helping to assure that perverts would not be able to use these camcorders. But if you're thinking that this switch can be defeated, you are absolutely right. It's also interesting to note the integration on this circuit board, of which there is a tremendous amount. If you look inside an old camcorder, you'll oftentimes see a lot of different integrated circuits, discrete components, delay lines for synchronization of audio and video as they traverse through the various circuits. But everything in this is handled by a couple of large-scale integration chips, and there's really not a whole lot on this board other than that. You can see some surface-mounted electrolytic capacitors and various connectors, but really the functions in this camcorder are pretty much situated across two large chips. We have a Fujitsu IC here, which is probably some kind of a microcontroller, and then we have a much larger IC here that actually has a fuse warning label on it, stating that you shouldn't uh, replace the fuse with something that is not a fuse or it's a grossly inappropriately rated fuse from Little Fuse Incorporated. But this large chip back here here is probably the all-in-one solution for the video processing needs of this camcorder. So that's a pretty thorough exploration of things, 16 minutes and 32 seconds worth. It's time to actually do the swap and see if the end result is a properly functioning camcorder or not. Now I should say this is not a how-to video. If you're watching this video and you haven't read the description, as all too many people don't, you're going to be very disappointed if you're trying to fix a problem with your own DCR TRV 280 Handycam. But as previously stated, you can find the service manual available for free download online, and if you are intelligent enough to use it and understand the risks of disassembling any electronic device, you probably can fix at least some of the more basic problems with these camcorders. And now I have two dismantled handycams instead of just one, but my exploratory surgery has definitely proven enlightening. You can see that a number of broken pieces and one screw fell out of the camcorder after I'd taken it apart, so even if I wasn't planning to repair this, it wouldn't have been a bad idea to disassemble things anyway, just to make sure that none of this could fall deeper into the electronics or the tape mechanism and foul either one of them. But there's the extent of the damage. Handycams are not exactly drop rated, and it actually sheared off the mounting posts to which one of those screws was driven into. The other screw is still in place, but its mounting post is a complete write-off as well. So it doesn't look like it would be very easy to repair this display. Probably doable, but definitely not all that easy. And the erratic operation is definitely explained by this breakage, because right here is the, mi is the micro switch that serves to sense whether or not the swing out display assembly is actually open. So as I said previously, what I'm going to do, since this camcorder has been retired from active service, is I'm simply going to take the good side panel from it and put it into place on the still working camcorder. I will be putting this camcorder back together because it actually works perfectly as a standalone video source and I can find something to do with it, most probably in my broadcast studio for a temporary or even another permanent camera angle of some kind. But now it's time to go ahead and put things back together, the new display assembly, and the undamaged reflector unit for the light. I'm also, as previously stated, going to try to stick in a little bit of uh, foam padding here behind the stereo microphone in the front of the camcorder just to help to try and quiet down the tape mechanism noise. All right, before buttoning this thing up, I'm just going to test it and make sure that the display actually works when I turn it on. Seems to have reset it to the default settings. And it wants to have its clock set, but let's see if some of these image handling buttons, like the zoom button here, 
actually happen to work. We'll go ahead and push menu to cancel the clock if I can actually find the menu button. <laughs> there it is. And we'll see if these buttons work as anticipated. Yes, they do. And the record button should tell me to put a cassette in. And now it's time to take a look at swapping this light lens. This is actually a more difficult operation in my opinion. Just to go ahead and satiate those of you who want to see some actual repair content in this video, I'm going to try to do it with the camera rolling although that's not always the most conducive thing to do. The first thing we have to do in order to get at this LED light assembly is to disconnect this board from the camera. And in order to do that, you simply have to unplug this ribbon cable back here. Now, Sony used high quality connectors for these, but they're still kind of annoying to deal with. You basically have to lift up each side of these connectors in order to unlock the ribbon cable and then you can very gently and most importantly evenly pull that cable back out of there. The usual problem comes up with these when you go to put them back into place. It's not all that easy to flip them over but sometimes getting them to make reliable contact with their mating connector is a little bit on the entertaining side. Again you can see the circuit board here. This goes to various places as previously mentioned. The IR illuminators, the stereo microphone, the regular LED light, and I had forgotten about this, the USB and Firewire output as well as the audio video output connectors. So there's a lot of I.O. going across that little board. Very tiny board but very important so let's go ahead and see if I can get this foam off of here. This is sort of stuck down, and you don't want to maul it, which unfortunately it looks like I'm doing. It actually came off much easier in the other camera. And at the same time, you have to be very careful when you're doing this because you don't want to damage the underlying circuit board. So maybe to try and make this a little bit easier, I'll undo this screw. Having a slightly magnetized screwdriver is almost invaluable. It's worth its weight in gold for this kind of work. And maybe we can just cheat a little bit here by bending this thing backwards. There went the camcorder. This is why I don't usually shoot videos about this end of things, because it's really not my finest hour. You're not seeing me at my most professional here. But now we can go ahead and we can bend these little tabs inward on this reflector assembly and it simply pushes out. And we do want to make sure that when we put the new reflector in that it is lined up appropriately. And the way this appears to be laid out it looks like the opening for the two LEDs should point towards the top and the single LED should point toward the bottom. So we're going to put that in there and make that, blithely make that assumption. Never let anyone tell you I'm not an incredible optimist most of the time. And we'll go ahead and put that back into place. And then where'd our little screw go? I don't know. This is another bad practice. You're supposed to put these screws exactly back where they came from. But in this case, they're all the same length. They're also nearly microscopic. I have no idea where that one went. But I'll find it here in a moment. Go ahead and put this screw on the edge of the screwdriver. And when you're going into plastic threads like this, that might strip easily, it's a good idea to turn the screw backwards a little bit until you just hear the threads catch. You might have heard that tiny little click there. And that assures that the threads are seated because with these plastic threaded assemblies it's all too easy to cut new threads or to even crack the assembly and strip it out. You don't want to do any of those things. So we should be back in business with that now. It certainly looks a lot better than it did. Now it's time to go ahead and put the rest of the camera back together. Well, on this side at least, it's starting to look a lot less naked than it did a moment ago. Still a fair amount of assembly, or at least trim pieces, to put back into place on this side of things. But the front panel is back on the camera, and that means it's time to go ahead and give this thing functionality check. Go ahead and make sure that all of the major functions provided by the front panel work. Now if I wanted to do a really thorough job of this, 
I would probably actually hook something up to the FireWire USB and AV output connections. But I think that if any of the functions on the front panel of the camcorder work at all, that the others probably do as well. Now the battery for this camera is almost dead, so it probably won't stand too many of these shenanigans. But there's the video light, first in automatic and then on forced on operation. That thing really screams through the battery at an alarming rate. I'm surprised that the night shot illumination LEDs don't do the same, but maybe being as they're in a much different portion of the light spectrum, maybe they don't have to consume as much power to get as much of a result. And speaking of the night shot LEDs, here they are right now. Even though this HDR PJ200 is uh, equipped with an infrared light blocking filter. The output from those LEDs is so strong that at least a little bit of it gets past the filter. But to you and I, those LEDs would look completely invisible, or pretty much. They have a faint red glow, but that's about all that they manage to look like. So it looks like all the major functions are working here. The touch panel based, um, the touch buttons for the zoom function, the recording button, which says to insert a cassette, of course, same thing with the photo button and then of course the zoom controls here on the back of the camcorder as well. So all that remains to be done is to put a couple of these trim pieces back on, put the hand strap back in place, put the lens cap back on, and then I will go ahead and I will actually reassemble this other camcorder into a working state because as previously stated I intend to continue using it even if only as a video source. Now it just so happens that you've caught me right in the midst of editing this particular video and ordinarily I wouldn't include the actual editing process in a video that I'm making. But as it just so happens there has actually been a pretty fair amount of time that has elapsed between everything that you have just watched being committed to video and discussed and what I'm actually up to right now. I couldn't tell you exactly how long it's been for certain but I know that it has been a minimum of a month, probably at least two or three, somewhere in there. I think it was around November of 2014 that I shot this, and today it is Sunday, December 21st, 2014. So yeah, definitely a fair amount of time that has passed. I did not get any footage of uh, putting this camera back together, but I am shooting this with the DCR TRV280 right now, and I'm prepared to prove that to you, though I must say you'd better brace yourself because you're about to see a guy who has a face for radio here. <laughs> I promise you I won't do this too terribly long. But this would this is engaging the normally stupid trick of pointing two cameras at one another <laughs> and actually making use of that ordinarily very stupid stunt. Just so you can see that I am in fact actually using the DCR TRV280. I will hurry up and get that off of the screen. And then I will go ahead and I will shoot some test footage with this camcorder. And I will conveniently tack that on to the end of everything that you have seen so far. Just to ascertain whether or not this camcorder does in fact work correctly. So stay tuned! It is my understanding, by way of reliable sources, that you, the intrepid viewer on YouTube, can find almost anything that you would desire to watch here on this video sharing website. I believe this is very likely to be true. After all, I read it on the internet. And as we all know, anything that you read on the internet is true. In the unlikely event that this is not the case, I humbly offer for your viewing pleasure the following video footage of my opening a can of Pillsbury Grand's Instant Biscuits. In an interesting bit of trivia concerning Instant Biscuits, I have sometimes heard these referred to as WAP Biscuits, by virtue of the fact that sometimes when you unwind the outer wrapper on this can in preparation to open them, sometimes you have to strike or WAP the can in order to get it open. It is also very likely that when this can opens, which it will do under a considerable amount of pressure, that I will be startled by its sudden opening and I will flinch. This moment will also be, perhaps ironically, unflinchingly captured by the DCR TRV 280 Handycam. So let's get started. The 
first thing that we will have to find is the area on the can that is specially scored to allow for ready opening. Now it is perhaps suggested by the instructions on some of these cans that you should utilize a spoon in order to open the can with less risk of injury to yourself. I, however, have never been overly concerned by the matter of following instructions, so I am going to blithely proceed with unraveling the can. It is possible that the can could open suddenly and surprisingly, thus assuring that I will be unusually startled. Again, my flinching will be unflinchingly captured by the DCR TRV 280 Handicam. However, that appears to have not been the case here. So I will gently apply pressure with my thumb, my left-handed thumb since I am a southpaw, and the can will open suddenly, as it did. And there you have it. That is the opening of a can of instant biscuits, presented for your sincere viewing pleasure by UXW Bill here on YouTube. As you can see, this video is being shot around the holidays. We have our Christmas tree here, full of blinking and twinkling things. Although, rather curiously, a lot of the old standby Christmas ornaments and even the strings of lights that we have from the 1940s and 50s did not make an appearance this year. And speaking of Christmas light strings from the 40s and 50s, although I myself am not a collector of uh, vintage Christmas tree lighting things, I find it interesting that those have lasted and lasted and lasted over the years and yet these modern strings of lights, pretty much anything made within the last 30 years or so, well every time we bring them out it seems we've got one more that uh, went into the box working but did not come out in working order for this year. But there is one string of lights that uh, was made within the last 25 years or so that still works. This is actually something that I made clear back in the second grade. And we have kept it around all these years. This is just construction paper. And then on the end here, there used to be a power plug, but the plug has gone missing. <laughs> That's actually wallpaper. One of my second grade teacher kept a bunch of old uh, wallpaper books on hand, and she let us youngsters cut things out of them into various shapes and stuff like that. I made a lot of shiny things out of that uh, wallpaper book. Although I can't imagine that anybody ever wallpapered their room with shiny wallpaper like that. That almost seems like it would be a perceptional torture of some kind. <laughs> Especially if the room happened to be sunny. But they did obviously sell wallpapers like that once upon a time. And I usually use those things, being, if I, being as I've always had something of a technical slant and a technical interest during my existence, I oftentimes use those shiny things for to portray heating elements or um, solar panels, things like that. Go ahead and take a look at some of the other stuff that's around here for the holidays. We do have a lot of mainstays. Unfortunately, as I stated previously, a lot of them managed to stay in the box. But here's one that didn't. This is actually something from my mother's childhood. Apparently she and her sister all got, got one of these. And I think there might have been other members of her family, that extended family, that got them as well. This is a paper Christmas tree. You can tell it's kind of started to unfurl over the years. But take a look at all the gifts that are on the tree. You know, I always wondered about that, uh, that line in I'll Be Home for Christmas, about presents on the tree. I think that's the right song. I never did understand that until I saw this thing. I don't know if it was ever customary to put the actual presents on the tree or not. You can see that some of these presents are logical enough. There's a little whistle there. And here's a pocket watch. And some of these like the fish in the frying pan. And I think this is probably a milkshake. Who knows? Maybe it's a beer. <laughs> and a key. <laughs> a bathtub. A light bulb. A toothbrush. <laughs> a telephone. <laughs> Back from the time when the telephones that you could buy were black made of hard plastic and owned by the telephone company definitely something from a different era but yeah some of the gifts on here are pretty outlandish <laughs> although i think this thing is awesome and i would not trade it or get rid of it for anything if you have any information about it i would certainly appreciate hearing it 
Of course, I'll go ahead and turn the handy cam light off. While I'm, well, there I am in the mirror. This is how camera equipment gets broken right here. <laughs> I guess I'll afford it a little bit of protection by turning on the light. You turn on night shot and see what that does. Should reflect. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> it's nowhere near that bright to our eyes, but the camera certainly sees it as though it were a beacon in the night. And here's a look at the living room. This is our German-made Wieso wood stove. This thing puts a whole new spin on wood stoves. Anything you think you ever knew about wood stoves is wrong. That thing is just awesome. It never gets too hot to the touch anywhere. Not even on the top grill. And those ceramic tiles on the sides, they just radiate heat for hours. One thing you've probably noticed in my panning around the room is that we have no shortage of clocks. I figure this is probably payback for some naughty thing that I have done in my past. I don't know what that could be. It's just like standards. There are so many things to pick from. <laughs> There's the infamous electronic chiming clock. <laughs> but I figure that yes, this has to be payback for something that I have done because almost all of these clocks have the ability to chime. <laughs> Oh, and another cuckoo clock. Amazingly, that one's not running. This might be a clock from a Monty Python skit. It looks like an X clock to me. The movement's actually out being repaired because it was doing stupid things like chiming 8,000 times on the stroke of the hour. Not to mention that every hour that that clock recorded was actually more like four of them long or as little as 30 in some cases. And there's our old doorbell still working well. Presumably from some time in the 1940s or 50s from Rittenhouse Electric. Turns out that when I was dismantling the old cold forgotten Buick, <laughs> I discovered that the electronic chime module was made by Rittenhouse Electric, division of Emerson Electric by that particular point in their existence. The Rittenhouse Electric and Doorbell Company is long, long since gone by now. That cuckoo clock doesn't keep time worth keeping. And here's a rarity, this clock doesn't chime at all. It doesn't have any capability to make a noise. Well, maybe it does. It looks like there's something in the back of it that might be a piezoelectric beeper or chime, but it's never made a noise in all the years that we've had it. There I am panning around to the Christmas tree once again. Got some blinking and chasing lights this year, as I'm sure you can see. But I think it can be safely said at this point, while I stand around in the living room and dining room and I will gather about random things, <laughs> And yes, I love that word, that this Handycam is most assuredly properly fixed. These are called anniversary clocks, in case you're not familiar with these. You know why they call these anniversary clocks? Because they are so incredibly unreliable that they only keep time every X anniversary that they were purchased to commemorate. I don't know how it is. Well, this one looks to be mechanical, but this one I think is battery operated. I have an electrically operated one around here someplace. And then this one reflects the normal state of an anniversary clock in the fact that it is not running. All right, and there's some glass. I think some of that is stuff that my mother uh, did in her glass blowing class, although I don't think this hourglass was one of them, nor the uh, tan colored thing back there. But I think this is something that she did, and I think this is as well. And I don't know about that thing back there. But I do know that I have pretty much done enough wool gathering here. So I will leave you with a wonderful fade out on the uh, checkerboard that Furhead built when he was in high school. I'll bet you didn't know that Furhead had such fine motor control, did you? Furhead's a pretty surprising guy. Pumpkin. Look at the camera.
lop it. I may have to do that with this can. In the event that that happens, I will probably end up... <laughs> I did it better the first time. I wasn't for that stupid cuckoo clock. <laughs> I am such a dork. <laughs>